In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. We welcome you to our Perseverance family. And as always, we'd like to invite the Blessed Virgin Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and, one of, each and every one of us. How thankful we should be for Mary, who is also known as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Let's turn to Mary and ask her to be with us, as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's ask our spiritual guide to be with us. Our spiritual guide is of course, the Holy Spirit. He has many names. One of the names is the Counselor, another the Consoler, another the Paraclete. He's also known as the Gift of Gifts. He's known as the Finger of God. The Holy Spirit is also known as the Divine Architect. St. Paul calls him, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Father. He's our interior master, our teacher. Also, the Holy Spirit is our sanctifier. We're called to become saints. Jesus said, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. How can we arrive at this holiness? By the Holy Spirit, who's known also as the sweet guest of the soul. Let's turn to him in prayer and song. Beg him to enlighten us, to inspire with his desire to get closer to God, to pray deeper. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to give us the fire of divine love as we sing. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Now on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Fall afresh on me. Fall afresh on me. O Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, Pray for us. Saint Ignatius Loyola, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning to all of you. And today there's a lot on the agenda. 
and a lot of uh, different topics. Of course, the very center will be the Word of God that we'll be meditating upon and explaining during the course of our conversation. <clears throat> but invite all of you to really trust in God to be faithful to your holy hour. Remember, the holy hour is the hour of power. You give, the, you give God that hour every day, and he'll give you blessing during the other 23 hours during the course of the day. So be faithful to your holy hour, the hour of power, the hour that's going to give you a lot of light, a lot of strength, a lot of encouragement during the course of the day. Sometimes you might not experience a lot of powerful con consolation in your holy hour, but then during the course of the day, God's going to be sending you a lot of lights and a lot of inspiration. So sometimes God withholds his consolation and lights for some time later on during the course of the day when it's very necessary. Okay, uh, today I'd like to start off by talking about what happened 103 years ago. Today, today is July 13th. July 13th, 1917, Our Lady appeared to the three children of Fatima, to Lucia de los Santos, and her two cousins, Jacinta and Francisco Marto. And she revealed to them a very graphic vision. The graphic vision was that of hell. So the earth opened up and Our Lady was present there and wanted the children to look at this very graphic vision of hell. How can it be explained? Probably best to imagine a sea, but not so much of water, but a fire. In the fire, you can see the flames shooting up moving from left to right, the different colors in the flames. And then you could see these souls that were floating in the flames without any equilibrium. And they were different in the sense that some of the souls were transparent, others were toasted, Others were bronze, <clears throat> others would, would be brown, others would be, would be a darker hue, others were black. All of that indicating possibly the time that those souls had already been in this pit of hell. Now with that, also, there could be heard these loud, horrific cries from the souls. And they were cries of despair and cursing because these souls cast into hell would never exit from the pit of hell. Then they could see transpiercing some of these souls were these hideous, ugly, unknown animals that the children had never seen before in their lives. These hideous, unknown animals that were transpiercing the souls, causing them further suffering, were actually the devils. The devils were given permission by God to torture these damned souls. That's probably one of the best ways that I could explain 
this July 13th, 1917, apparition of Our Lady to the Children at Fatima. Now later on they were to say that if Our Lady were not there, then the children would have died of fear. However, we can know the fruit, rather the tree by its fruits. As a consequence of this July 13th vision of hell, these three children, especially Jacinta, went through a radical transformation. They were good children, but not perfect. Yesterday I started to read a book on, on Jacinta, the flower of Fatima. And one of the first churches speaks about the rust in her nature. In other words, the imperfections in this little girl that died only at nine years old had to be, had to be converted. One of the catalysts or means that God used to convert this little girl who never even learned how to read and write, nor her brother Francisco, was this vision of Fatima, of hell rather. And Jacinta would talk with Lucy and say, well, you know, that hellfire is going to end. Lucia said, no, it's for all eternity. But after a hundred years, no. After 500 years, no. After a thousand years, no. That eternal hellfire is forever and ever and ever and ever. So these children, as a result of this graphic vision of hell, were converted. In some modern theological corners or catechetical teaching, they fail to teach the last things. The last things are very important. In theology is called eschatology, the study of the last things. And this is the reality of death, judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, and eternity. One day we're going to die. As soon as we die, we're going to be judged. Our judgment will determine our life or lack of life for all eternity. The judgment will determine whether or not we're saved or damned. If we die in the state of grace, we're saved. If we die in the state of mortal sin, we're damned to hell for all eternity. So in this day in which we're calling to mind what happened July 13th, it should be part of our prayer to pray in a special way for the conversion of poor sinners especially to pray for the conversion of deathbed sinners. Pray, offer your holy hour, offer your rosary, offer up sacrifices. These children practice heroic virtue because Our Lady loved them, wanted them to see the stark reality of hell tell you one little thing that they did, then we'll move into our other topics. It was a hot summer, humid day. And the children were out in the fields. Apparently they had brought no water to drink. 
So Lucy said, well, I'll go to one of the neighboring houses and ask if they can give us a pitcher of water. So Lucy goes and the neighbor generously offers them a pitcher of water so that the children can have something to drink to slake their thirst. Upon arriving, Jacinta says, why don't we offer that as a sacrifice? And the other two agreed. So they took the pitcher of water and they actually poured it into the ground so that these children could suffer thirst for the salvation of our mortal souls. My friends, one soul is worth more than the whole universe. Let's pray to Saint Jacinta. Let's pray to Saint Francisco. They're both canonized in the year 2017 by Pope Francis in Fatima, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the first apparition May 13th. Lucia died in the year 2005, so she's a servant of God now. <clears throat> she only died <coughs> 15 years ago. <clears throat> she died at the same time that John Paul II died, within a few weeks. Let's pray to Jacinta and Francisco that the world will be converted. Let's pray that this pandemic will force people to stop, to think, to meditate, and to pray, and to turn back to God. It's only God can save us. Human means and Biology and medicine and discoveries can help to a limited degree. But when all is said and done, God is the one that can really help us. So I thought I would bring that to your attention today because today is July 13th. Our Lady appeared May, May 13th, six times all the way up until October 13th. Here's a beautiful depiction of Lucy's vision in Spain when she, when she becomes a Dorothean nun. You can see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Our Lady of Fatima, the Rosary, and below you can see Lucia contemplating this Eucharistic as well as this Trinitarian image. So we're going to be moving now into the riches of the Word of God. My friends, two weeks ago, we spent the whole week reading and meditating one of the minor prophets. His name was Amos. He's the prophet that preached against social injustices. You might call him the precursor of the social doctrine of the church, which means to follow Christ, we should be concerned about alleviating, helping the plight of the poor, the orphans, the widows, the hungry, the sick, the elderly. That would be a modern application of the book of Amos. We have to be concerned to see Christ in our brothers and sisters. Last week, we meditated upon another minor prophet, and that was Hosea. And Hosea gave us the analogy between Israel, the spouse related to God. Israel would be the wife. God would be the husband. And by means of this analogy, the prophet speaks about God always being faithful but Israel, unfaithful. But God is merciful. God is a true lover. God is always ready to forgive if we return. 
got the beautiful parable of the prodigal son. God the Father was always waiting, but he's respecting the freedom. One of our problems is sometimes we, we commit sin and we simply don't want to give it up. Pope Francis once said that God is always ready to forgive, but we're not always ready to ask for forgiveness because of our pride, our stubbornness. So the, with David, we should learn how to say, God, I have sinned. My sin is always before me. Have mercy in me because I have sinned. A broken and humble heart, O Lord, you will not spurn. O Lord, send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. So in the Mass, we're going through the prophets. So we finished Amos and Hosea. This week, we started on Friday, actually, or Saturday. We've entered into the reading and reflection on one of the major prophets and considered by most, I would say, and that would be the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. That is the prophet Isaiah. So today we have, we, we have the first chapter of Isaiah and we've got verse 10 to 17. I invite all of you to, to listen attentively to the word of God. Hear the word of the Lord, princes of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, people of Gomorrah. What care I for the number of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of whole burnt rams and fat of fatlings in the blood of calves lambs and goats, I find no pleasure. I'd okay, like to pull out one idea from that first couple of verses. He mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. If you go to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 19, we encounter the two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abram, and his family, I'm sorry, Lot and his family, Lot was a relative of Abraham. They're living on the outskirts of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his wife and his daughters and in-laws, just a few people. But Sodom and Gomorrah were two very rich cities. A lot of money, a lot of possessions, a lot of pleasure, but there are two cities that had given in to many sins, sins against nature. And Lot had a visitor, two visitors, they're actually angels, that they appeared to be young, attractive men. So some of the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah had learned of these young, attractive men. So they wanted to practice what's called sodomy. They wanted to practice sexuality, a perverse sexuality using these men. So they go to the door and they knock on the door. And the door is locked and Lot does not want to give. They say, we want those men. We want to lay with them. Lot is willing to give his daughters. But these men, filled with passion, would not have that. So they're knocking on the door, and Lot will not open up the door. Finally, they break down the door. And the angels confront them and blind them. And God says to Lot to flee from Sodom and Gomorrah because he was going to chastise Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot would not leave. So the angel had to take Lot by the hand and pull him out he and his wife and his children. And he told no one to look behind. Lot's wife looked behind. She was turned into a, into a pillar of salt. Then God, he rained down 
from heaven, fire and brimstone, which destroy totally the people, the inhabitants of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's nothing and no one left. That can be found in Genesis chapter 19. I'm just recounting a biblical passage. So what God is saying by that, Sodom and Gomorrah, is God does not agree with same-sex unions. God does not agree with transgenderism. God does not agree with sexual changes. Rather, God wants us to respect human nature, that God created man and woman, male and female. God said <clears throat> to the man, you shall leave your father and mother and you shall be united to your wife. What God has united, let no man rent asunder. So I think, my friends, in our defense of, of truth, in our defense of traditional marriages, <clears throat> in our defense of a marriage between man and woman, Adam and Eve, the best source for us is the Word of God. Not so much what sociologists or psychologists or political scientists or the newspaper or the news at 10 o'clock in the evening, what they say, but rather, what does the Word of God say? Because the Word of God is the word of truth. So I'm not going to be talking more about that topic right now, maybe later, but I've given you a very clear biblical passage, Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 19, is when Sodom and Gomorrah, those two very rich cities, where people have given themselves up to debauchery, immorality, sexual perversion, unbridled passion, sexual immorality, men desiring men and women, women. God showed that he was not happy with that. So much so that God sent a chastisement with fire and brimstone from heaven. Let's pray for those people who have chosen that lifestyle that they would, God would give them light to recognize that there is a natural law, it is a divine law that goes beyond social mores that's confusing so many people, our poor children today. Make sure you parents, you've got children and teenagers, you have to sit down and talk to them about this topic. Not when your children go away to college, they're going to come back with a lot of, they're going to have a sexual identity crisis. So now it's up to you parents right now. Don't wait until tomorrow. Sit down and have a long talk. You've got a son, say you are a boy. Girl, say you are a girl. Try to, even though it's, it's so simple and so easy to understand, we've never lived in a world with so much information. We've never lived in a world that was so much confusion as today. So make sure you do that for the salvation of your family. Let's move on. Prophet Isaiah, he says, when you come to me, to visit me, who we'll ask these things of you, trample my courts no more. Bring no more worthless offerings. Your incense is loathsome to me. New moon and Sabbath, calling of assemblies, Octaves with wickedness, these I cannot bear. Your new moons and festivals I detest. 
they weigh me down. I tire of the load. When you spread out your hands, I close my eyes to you. Though you pray, the more I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves clean. Put away your misdeeds from before my eyes. Cease doing evil. Learn to do good. Make justice your reign. Redress the wrong. Hear the orphan's plea. Defend the widow. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, what is Isaiah saying? I'm going to try to be as, as simple as possible. Isaiah is saying this. The Israelites, they are offering sacrifices. They're offering animals. They're offering their prayers. They're going to the temple. They're going to the synagogue. They're offering their prayers, sacrifices, worship. But God is not pleased with that. Not so much that God is rejecting prayer and sacrifice and their oblations. Quite the contrary. But what they're doing is they're failing to live out the commandment of loving their neighbor. The very end, the last verse, is the clincher to understand it. The prophet says, says, cease doing evil, learn to do good. In other words, give up your sin. They've got blood on their hands. How much blood do we have on our hands because of abortion today in our country and our world? And make justice your aim. Redress the wronged. Hear the orphans play. Defend the widow. In the society of Isaiah, this is hundreds of years before Christ. The two, the three most vulnerable people in the society would be the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. The widow did not have social security. The widow did not have a lot of money in the bank. The widow did not the widow did not have support. Also the the orphan. They are at the mercy of society, the mercy of their relatives. So if no one decided to help them, they, they could actually die of hunger. So the word of God is saying, go to the temple to pray. Offer your sacrifice. Don't neglect that. But also don't neglect to see that I am present. Not only the temple, not only the sacrifice, not only the offering of fatlings or bulls or heifers, I am also present in the world. I'm also present in the people that are placed in your path. If you want a parallel biblical passage to flesh this out, Matthew chapter 25. Jesus says this very clearly. He says, I was hungry. You gave me to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a foreigner and you welcomed me. I was sick and in prison and you came to visit me. When, Lord? 
that we see you hungry and thirsty and naked and a foreigner and sick and in prison. And Jesus will respond, whenever you did it to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Enter into the joy of my Father in heaven. So Isaiah is saying there has to be, there has to be a harmonious blend between our worship of God and our service of our brothers and sisters. Hopefully I'm clear. So in your meditation, pray to see in your prayer, maybe there's someone in your path, in your family, that is in need of help. You have to be their hands, their feet. You have to be their support. And by helping them out, you're really helping out our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because he says, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you've done to me. Psalm 50 the response to the psalm is, to the upright, I will show the saving power of God. To the upright. What does the upright mean? We are called to be upright. The opposite of upright would be the deceitful, the liars, those that take advantage of others those who are not transparent. The upright are those who are honest, sincere. They're transparent. They're childlike. Let's pray that we would be upright people, not deceptive. So my friends, we move from the first reading and the response or real psalm, we move to the gospel. Okay, we've been going through the gospel of St. Matthew the past few weeks. So the gospel of Matthew today is a very challenging gospel. But I think it's very applicable to what's going on today. I'd like to read some of the passages and comment these passages with you. You're going to see how countercultural these these verses from Matthew chapter 10. So we've Take Matthew chapter 10, 34, 34, all the way to chapter 11. Here's a question as I explain this passage. Does Jesus come to bring us peace? There's a question. You might say, well, uh, Isaiah says he's the Prince of Peace. When he greets the people, he says, Shalom, peace be with you. In that you're right. He is the Prince of Peace. And also the word Shalom is the way in which the uh, Israelites would greet each other. But not always is Jesus going to be a source of peace. So I'd like to read a few of the verses and stop and comment upon them. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. So we want the Word of God to be in our minds. We want the Word of God to be in our lips. We want the Word of God to be in the very depths of our hearts. 
These are the words of Jesus direct, directed to you and to me right now. Jesus said to his apostles as well as to us, Do not think that I have come to bring peace upon the earth. I have come to bring not peace, but the sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's enemies will be those of his household. Very, very strong words. And I'll give you an application of that. Maybe I'm partially the culprit in this sense. Many of you know that over the past 14 years, I have been giving a pro program called the Spiritual Exercises Program which lasts 10 weeks. And actually what we're doing now, I've given the title of our encounter. I call it a family. This is called perseverance. Why do we call it perseverance? And after about two months ago, a little bit less, I finished the 10 week spiritual exercises online. Now many of you have gone through the exercises with me. I gave it to the couples for Christ. About 4,000 were doing it throughout the country at the same time. Now, if you went through the 10-week program that I've constructed, been giving over the past 14 years, if you did the exercises well, and I hope you did. Maybe went through your examination of conscience where you made your general confession. Then you heard the call of the king. Then you followed up in trying to write out a plan of life. Maybe even read my book, Roadmap to Heaven. Something happened in your life. Your spiritual life was challenged to go beyond what was possibly mediocrity. Maybe you were lukewarm. Maybe you're just giving yourself to the Lord 50%. So these exercises challenged you to go beyond the norm, to go beyond the status quo, not to be a minimalist, but the magis, give the Lord everything. In other words, you really went through a transformation of life. And this transformed your whole being. Consequently, you you chose certain actions, practices of piety that never occurred to you before. And say, for example, okay, you, you've gone through this and your husband has not done the exercises. Or your 25-year-old son. So there you are. You get up at 5.30 in the morning. You spend an hour in prayer. Not only that, but you felt motivated to go to Mass. In the evening, you ask your family to pray the rosary with you. Now, instead of going to confession every year, you go once a month. You feel even motivated to go to daily Mass. 
You no longer put up with bad language in the house. Certain TV programs that you would sit and watch, you shun them now. You've bought an image of Mary and Jesus that you want to place in your room. Your husband looks at you and he thinks that you're crazy. Your son has started to call you a religious fanatic. You're a nut. You've lost it. And what they do, they start to throw barbs at you. They insinuations. And they start to laugh at you. They start to mock you. They start to make fun of you. They even get angry at you. And they say, look, honey, your husband, this stuff of Father Broome, it's over the top. This is crazy. Why don't you back, go back, go back, go back and be a normal person. <clears throat> honey, listen. Go back and be just a normal person. You don't have to get up at 5.30 to make this, what is a holy hour? It's a crazy hour. Why do you want to go to daily mass? Go on Sunday. You know, we used to pray together. Three Hail Marys before we would retire. Now you want to pray the rosary, even the chop of divine mercy. You want to watch the Oblates Holy Hour? You have lost it. And your son confirms what your husband is saying. You are being attacked. Where are you being attacked? In your own home. Those that you love most, those that you care most for, those with whom you're sharing your life, are turning out to be those who are most antagonistic. And they're even attacking you because you have decided to follow Jesus 100% and to give yourself to him unreservedly. Listen, Jesus follows up on that with these words. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Okay, I'm going to give you another example. Your husband and son have made these two decisions. This coming weekend, they're going to be traveling to Las Vegas for two reasons. They're on vacation, and there in Las Vegas, one of the relatives, one of their nephews, has decided to have a civil marriage with another man, a same-sex union. So your husband and your son have decided they're going to go to Las Vegas to relax and to see some of the shows and to unwind in this time of pandemic. And also they want to go to the this same-sex union of the nephew with another man. Then there's going to be, uh, be a big banquet. 
So who has been invited? Your husband, your son, you've been invited too. What are you going to do? Now that your conscience is being more refined, you're making your holy hour. You've read through an examination of conscience. You already have a spiritual director that you're talking to on a monthly basis. You're going to confession every two or three weeks. You're reading the lives of the saints and you're reading some of the writings of the magisterium. You're very clear to you. By going to Las Vegas, you're placing yourself in the near occasion of sin because of the immoral social milieu present there. It's almost going to be impossible for your eyes and mind not to be tarnished, tainted by immorality. Furthermore, you're a staunch a believer and defender of what is called the traditional marriage as transmitted by the Bible, by the words of Jesus Christ. He said, a man will leave his father and mother and that man will be united to his wife. Let no man rent asunder what God has put together. So your husband, as well as your son, and other relatives are going to be going to Las Vegas to enjoy their vacation, but also they're going to be participating in this same sex union. You're the only one in the family that's not, going to, that's not going to be going. What's going to happen? You're going to be ostracized. You're going to be criticized. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be rejected. They're going to call you a hypocrite and a Pharisee. They're going to say, look at this woman. She says her prayers, prays her rosary, makes her holy hour, goes to Mass, goes even daily Mass. And she's not going to be participating in this, this celebration. They're going to say, God is love. Who are you? to deny these two men the ability to love each other. That this gospel today is very, very important. This gospel today, you can understand very clearly in what's going on in the world today. This gospel that you heard You've probably already experienced it, or you may in the future. But Jesus is very clear. He's categorical. Jesus says, whoever loves father or mother or husband or son or nephew, whoever loves them more than me, is not worthy of me. So we have to make the choice. Will we follow God? Will we follow in the footsteps of Jesus? And suffer? Be persecuted? Or will we follow others? Will we, will we cater to 
public opinion. Here we have it. Are we going to be a God pleaser or a people pleaser? There we have it. You have to make that decision. Jesus goes on to say, you cannot love father or mother, son or daughter above me. Our God is a jealous lover. God wants to take second place to nobody. God doesn't want part of you. God wants all of you. You remember a couple weeks ago, we celebrated these English martyrs. They were St. Thomas More, the Bishop, St. John Fisher, the Jesuit priest, St. Edmund Cambion, the married woman, St. Margaret Clitheroe. These are called the English martyrs. Henry VIII opened up the door to Thomas More and John Fisher if they simply were willing to accept his second marriage to Anne Boleyn and accept him as being the new head of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. If so, they would have their position, they would have power, prestige, money, pleasure, honor, if they simply would accept Henry VIII, Thomas More, John Fisher, Edmund Cambion, the three of them ended up in the Tower of London. And the relatives of Thomas More tried to convince him just to give in, to save his life. John Fisher was the only bishop that did not capitulate to the desires of King Henry VIII. What happened? John Fisher and Thomas More, they were both decapitated. Their heads were cut off. So the gospel today, my friends, uh, read through it and try to try to read through it and apply this to the society in which we live, the country that we're living in now. Try to apply it to your to your extended family. You're going to see how this is happening in your extended family. Try to even apply this to your own blood family. And beg for the grace not to be, not to be a people pleaser. but to be a God pleaser. Beg for the grace, as Jesus says, to live out the greatest commandment. And that greatest commandment is this. Beg for the grace in your holy hour to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength and to love your neighbor as your strength. Let's ask St. Jacinta, St. Francisco, and Our Lady of Fatima that we will be courageous and always, always, always love God first in our lives. The Lord be with all of you. the intercession of a lady of Fatima and God's angels and saints. May God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son.
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.